Chapter 70, Amateur Dramatics Amateur Dramatics Jahara gazed down at the sloping plains of Athkatla, the city nestled against the coast, as grey and dull as the storm clouds gathering above it, the sky so dark it was difficult to believe it was the middle of the afternoon. They had come to a halt on the edge of the forest, still an hour or so's walk away from the city itself, but Valigar was wary of entering Athkatla and it had been decided that he and Jahara would wait outside the city and approach at nightfall, sneaking inside the walls to meet the others and go straight to summoning the sphere, Fritha tasked with the rather fitting charge of relaying an appropriate lie to the cowled wizards. Right, Valigar, the girl began, clapping her hands together enthusiastically, you're still on the run so you're staying here and, Jahara, you've been killed by Valigar so you can stay here to keep him company. Though I would have though it impossible, she is actually getting otter, muttered the ranger at her shoulder, Jahara sending him what she hoped was a disapproving glare as she considered the same herself. The rest of you, continued Fritha turning back to the others, seemingly oblivious, the cowled wizards likely have eyes everywhere so we will need to project this feeling of failure and loss as soon as we enter the city walls, and on that note, is everyone ready with their sad thought? I'm happy to help you if you can't think of one by yourself. Around her, the group seemed to pause as one, sharing a moment of reflection and it was as though the dark clouds above them had suddenly deepened. A no-man glanced to Fritha and turned abruptly away, Airy dipping her face to play with the fraying silk embroidery at her cuff while Minsk muttered something to Boo, Cern turning a bleak look on the city they were about to enter. Right, said Fritha, with much less of her previous buoyancy as she turned back to Jahara with a tired smile, we will see you both later then. The rain broke within moments of them parting. Just light at first, it was soon a downpour the clouds opening to unleash the torrent they had been threatening all day and they spent that last hour's walk tramping across the muddy plains, the weather at least helping them project the required air of misery as they trudged, hunched under their cloaks, through the gates. The two watchmen stationed there had waved them through with barely a glance, no desire to leave the shelter of the narrow guard hoot, Fritha bringing their small group to a halt at the corner of the first street. A no-man swept the wet hair from his forehead with a cold hand, the street about them empty and hazy with the rain. The water was pelting against the cobbles to send up clouds of spray, the ground beneath their feet already more puddles than pavestone and a no-man did not like to contemplate what state the slums would be in. Gods, I don't envy those two, camping out in this, Fritha muttered to no one in particular as she gazed up at the sky, dropping her attention back to those about her. Right, I'll see you lot later. You are not returning to the inn first? Asked Cerned, the mule already tugging impatiently at the halter in his hand. No, I had better go and speak with Toljerias straight away, let him know what's what, as it were. Should you go alone? Asked Eri, but Fritha waved her offer of an escort away before she had even ventured it. It will be fine. No one would dare attack me here and it is better I go on my own, I'll need to present things in the right way. She finished tactfully. Or lying through her teeth at it was also known, considered a no-man as he watched her marched off, lost to the rain-veiled street after only a few yards. The coronet was crowded, the air humid as the many people within attempted to dry themselves around the four large fireplaces. The group had secured a berth in a local stable for their mule, going to see Bernard about their own accommodations and taking the time to wash and change into something dry before the three men returned to the tavern once again, Airy staying in her room to catch up on some sleep. They managed to get one of their usual tables next to the rain-patterned glass of the windows, the maid finally arriving with a pitcher of warmed mead which was more than worth the wait. A no-man had taken a seat with a good view of the door glancing up every time he heard it open and earning himself a scowl from Minsk each time he did so, and he was sat there for just long enough to begin worrying when the door creaked open once more and a blue cloak wrapped bundle he recognized as Fritha stepped over the threshold. Hello again, 
she greeted breathlessly, throwing back her hood and shaking out her hair as she reached them, her face a contrast of white and pink from the cold, damp curls plastered to her neck and forehead. How went your meeting, young Fritha? rumbled Minsk. Oh, very well, I believe, she answered, gingerly removing her sodden cloak to hang it over the back of the nearest chair and nearly upsetting it with the weight of wet wool. It's always hard to tell, but he seemed eager enough, especially when I told him Valigar had killed Jahara and how his capture was a personal quest for me now. And Toljarias believed you. Came a nomen, finding it difficult to marry the girl's words with the mild way she had spoken them. Oh yes, no trouble. I was the epitome of the wrathful bereaved, still lost and vulnerable in grief, and naive enough to believe with a burning passion that vengeance would somehow make me feel better. I even managed to break down in tears at one point and had to take a moment to heroically compose myself. You should have seen Toljariaz's face, no man could ever feign such ill-disguised dismay as he made clumsy attempts to comfort the young woman crying on other side of his desk. The arrogant snake. She added rather more bitterly, the more I speak with him, the less I think he had any intention of returning Imoen to me, or even the power to do so. Minsk frowned and nodded in stern agreement. Well, then Boo says, all the better we agreed to help good Valigar. You should sit, young Fritha, and take ale with us. Oh, not for me thanks, Minsk, she smiled. I'm going up to my room for a very deep bath with an even deeper cup of wine and you will not see me until the moon is risen. Across the tavern, the door banged open again and a no-man's heart groaned as the short figure threw back his rain-soaked hood and he recognized Mech. Lady Patron Or, alternatively, muttered Cerned. Fritha said nothing, just closed her eyes and drew a long deep breath waiting until the child had reached her side before turning to greet gently, Hello Mech. The boy grinned. Fair met to you, m'lady, it's been a while ain't it? How did you know Fritha had arrived back? Asked the druid with a frown, Mech squaring up to it boldly. I got me contacts. A couple o. Kids I used to know live over the street. I told M to come fetch me when you arrived back, m'lady. It gold's been going spare these last few days, problems with the script or some such like. Surely it can wait until tomorrow, Fritha. A no-man countered, knowing the girl would insist upon going, but feeling his objection should be made all the same. Fritha smiled tiredly and predictably shook her head. It likely could but I wouldn't wish a fretting Higgold on anyone. Well, I could attend with you, if you would like. No, no, a no man, no need for us both to get wet. Well, then take my cloak, at least, he pressed, making to hand her the bundle of wool that had been steaming by the nearby fireplace, but the girl took a step back dropping her arms to her sides. Ah oh no, it's fine a no-man, I'm already wet, it wouldn't make any difference. Mech was sending them a curious look, something Fritha seemed to want to put a stop to before the child could draw any conclusions of his own, the girl swinging her sodden cloak back about her with a barely concealed shiver of disgust. Come on, Mech, let's see what he wants. A brief farewell and the pair were gone. Right. Fritha snapped, the rehearsal which had been taking place on the stage before her suddenly frozen. Higold was stood in the auditorium below, a copy of the script open in his hand, the man whirling to face her as she stalked down center aisle, rain pelted and frowning and Fritha considered she probably looked quite fearsome, the brisk walk through the city with Mech only giving time for her annoyance at been called out again time to mature. I have only just set foot back in Ithkatla but it seems I cannot have even one day within the city walls without some crisis requiring my presence here, 
so what is it now? Higold hesitated, wringing his hands nervously and she could see he, too, was now wondering if this was not something that could have waited till the morning. I, ah, uh, yes, greetings, my lady patron. Well, do you recall, my lady, giving Zurin permission to rewrite the script? If looks could kill, poor Higold would have been instantly disemboweled. Yes, yes, of course, you do, he continued hastily, well, there have been complaints. Ah, it is probably best if I bring forth those concerned. He called them forward, Ilthea already on the stage, Jenna and the sullen figure of Zurin marching in from the wings, the latter clearly not about to let these derisions on his artistry pass uncontested. Lady Patron, Zurin nodded respectfully before launching into his tirade at the director, you cannot deny the play is better, Higold. No one does, cried Jenna, before the man had even a chance to reply, but it changes every day. The rest of the lines no longer fit with the tone of the piece, added Ilthea critically. Zurin sent her a quelling glare. I have already said I would look over those as well, if you wish. I can't relearn all my lines, cried Davith, looking stricken. You would be no worse off, you don't know them now, said Ilthea scathingly. The lad flushed scarlet though Higold ignored their bickering, his attention still on Zurin. We haven't time for you to go fiddling about with the other lines, man. By Millel, our opening night is just under a fortnight away. You see our problem, my lady. Higold continued more calmly as he turned back to Fritha, without a set script to work from, rehearsals are a complete shambles. Fritha sighed sending a stern look to the man on the stage above her. What happened to me not regretting this, Zurin? And, Higold, why on real do you need me here? You are the director, well, direct. Just make a final decision on the script and stick to it. Higold pursed his lips slightly, glancing up to the heavens with sniff as he answered tartly, Well, my lady, I would have but since you were the one to allow Zurin to change the script in the first place. Give me that. Fritha snapped, snatching the manuscript from his hand, Mech stood behind her and shaking with silent laughter at the scolding his boss was getting. I will rewrite this tonight myself, and that will be the draft that is used. And that will be it. She continued, striking the papers against her hand with every point as she glared about at them all. There will be no invasions of fanatics, Termian, or otherwise, no evil spirits waltzing about the place, no musicians buggering off with all copies of the score. No upstaging, no improvising, no more. The next time I see Mech it will be to invite me to view the final dress rehearsal. Good night. And with that, she turned and swept out, Higold's affronted tones drifting after her. Well, I don't think there was any need for those histrionics. The rain is easing, rumbled Minsk, taking another long draft of meat as he turned back from the windows. Cern nodded absently. I wonder how Jahara and Valigar are faring. Bu says, though he may not trust us. Valigar is worthy of our trust, all will be well. A no man let their voices drift over him, his mind occupied with troubles of his own. He should not have let Fritha go to the theatre alone, for though she left with Mech, he knew she would not make the boy escort her back. She was placing too much confidence in the city walls and the reluctance of the Harpers to disturb the peace within them. The Harpers may not to attack them there but a no-man doubted any bounty hunters would be concerned for the same and with a thousand gold pieces resting upon her now, Fritha was prize enough alone. A no-man A no-man glanced up to find Cerned and Minsk both looking at him, the Rashami wearing a heavy scowl. Sorry. 
concerned was plainly trying not to smile, the man repeating kindly, I said that was the sixth bell if you still wish to attend Evensong. Oh, I. A no man broke off as the door was slammed shut and Fritha stalked into the tavern for a second time, though much removed from her previous good humor, it seemed, the girl looking fit to kill. She didn't even glance in their direction, let alone come to speak with them, just marched straight to the bar to be lost in the crowds, and a no man was on his feet only a moment later, cup in hand. If you would excuse me. Fritha, is everything all right? He asked as he found her, the girl already sat at the bar, a sheaf of papers in her hand, eyes flicking back and forth as she read over them making notes here and there with a worn stub of pencil, though she glanced up as she saw him. Yes, fine, she answered shortly, frowning as she went back to her reading. Well, are you coming to join us at the table? Hmm. No, I'll head upstairs once my drinks arrived. I'm waiting for another batch of spiced wine to be heated. A no man worked to suppress a smile as he continued casually, Spiced wine? How fitting, sweet with just the right amount of bite. Fritha snorted, his poetical angle nothing if not wholly unexpected, it seemed, the girl making a cursory glance to his cup. Oh, very nice. And what are you drinking? Mead? Excellent. Far too syrupy and liable to make me vomit. But a no man just laughed. There was a time when I would have been offended by such, but you, I cannot be angry with you. You seem to manage quite well as a rule, Fritha muttered sullenly, turning back to the papers in her hand. May I ask what you are doing? A no man continued, abandoning his attempts to bring her from this ill humor as an impossibility as she tugged scratching two sharp lines through something and scribbling furiously underneath. Rewriting the script for that idiotic play, she answered dully, no pause to her scrawl. Zurin kept reworking it, the cast complained, so now I am writing the final version. She sighed, frowning slightly before striking out yet another line with venom. What nonsense, I can't believe I let Higold choose this rubbish. A no man frowned as well, her rancor unusual enough to be disturbing. You liked it well enough before, Fritha. I never had to write lines for it before. Tragic tale of love and sacrifice, my eye. The only tragedy is how painfully thick the two leads are. Karenina insists she loves Veldon, even though he is old and practically immortal and they both know that to accept their love is to doom Karenina to a life in his mage tower separated from her people while she withers away and dies as us poor mortals have a one to do. So what does Veldon do? He returns her affections, lives with her until the spring and then turns her to stone of all things, so as to protect her from the cruel ravages of the world. A no man drew back slightly, wondering if there was not something more to her sudden disdain for the play. Well. Perhaps though I believe others see it a different way. Veldon sacrifices his one chance of love to save Karenina from the misery of loving him. Fritha snorted. Oh, yes, very noble of him. And the end result is that she is as good as dead and he has the rest of eternity to mope about crying over her statue, the idiot. And what should he have done then? The girl shrugged as though it was obvious. Just waited until the spring and sent her packing, of course, back to her village. She may not have wanted to leave him. So? He should have just made her. A no man could feel his temper rising. Even though it was her decision? And what of her desires in the matter? Why should Veldon make the choice for them both? Fritha returned his glare, her eyes narrowed. Well, perhaps she would have seen the wisdom of it when she was back in her comfortable old farmhouse, 
surrounded by merry grandchildren and contemplating a long life well lived. Well, it is your production, my lady, why do you not just rewrite it then? A no man snapped, all attempts at self-control forgotten now. Perhaps I will. She bit back defiantly, and everyone will leave the theater with a smile on their faces rather than crying into their wine over this drivel. Right, there you are, miss, came Bernard behind them, the man setting a steaming flagon of dark red liquid on the counter. Oh, my thanks, Fritha muttered, seeming rather flustered as she turned to pay him and a no-man watched as she gathered up her papers, finally glancing back to him as she stepped from the stool. Well, if you'll excuse me, a no-man, I should get as much of this finished as possible before we have to leave. Yes, good luck, he wished her sneeringly, I am sure the new ending will be a success. Fritha sent him a tight smile and brushed past him, heading for the stairs. As am I. Airy waited, listening to the sound of his footsteps fade along the corridor and the distant slam of a door before she turned raising her skirts as she tripped lightly back up the staircase she had been halted upon. After so many days out in the elements, she had started to feel the beginnings of a cold developing and had made a draft and put herself to bed as soon as they had returned to the city, hoping to forestall the ailment. And sure enough, after a wash and a few hours sleep, Airy had awoken feeling much refreshed and ready to join the others downstairs for something to eat, though she had not even reached the tavern in the end a no-man coming up the stairs as she was descending them. He had seemed a touch unhappy, though he had spoken mildly enough, telling her the latest news of Toljerias, only mentioning when she questioned his mood that he had had another quarrel with Fritha, the melancholy way he had dismissed it telling the elf more than his brief account had, before the man had continued his glum trudge up the remaining steps. And Eri had made her decision there and then, the girl back on the first floor hallway by now and moving along it to raise a hand and knock soundly on Fritha's door. Fritha? Yes. Came the muffled reply, Airy pushing the door open to find Fritha laid across her bed on her stomach, her face almost hidden under the mass of auburn curls where her hair had been left to dry untamed, the girl poring over a manuscript of sorts, stylus in hand and did not glance up as she entered. A problem, Airy? No, not especially, Airy answered, closing the door and helping herself to the room's only chair, knowing from experience that in moods like this Fritha would let her stand in the doorway all night, if only to punish her timidity. I just met a no-man on my way down to the tavern, she continued conversationally feeling rather liberated at how unruffled she was by the girl's so far less than warm welcome. He was retiring for a few hours before we leave, he did not look very happy. Oh, really? Fritha muttered absently, still scribbling away. Airy frowned, but persisted. You know, he can be quite sweet sometimes. So can a lot of people, your point? Fritha challenged sharply, dotting something with more ferocity that was perhaps necessary and spotting the quilt beneath her with ink. Airy sighed. What I mean is, perhaps you should give him a chance. No, said Fritha airily, I don't think we're going to be doing that but if you are suddenly finding you might like to, then please, be my guest. Certainly not! exclaimed Airy feeling herself going pink at even the suggestion of it. But Fritha was looking up at her for the first time during their exchange, the girl suddenly grinning broadly. Now, now, Airy, don't dismiss this out of hand, he is a knight and you live for all that courtly love malarkey. You would be perfect for each other. You're just teasing me in hopes that I will give up, the elf observed sharply, but it's not going to work. I've spoken to him, Fritha, he seems very unhappy with the way things are between you at the moment. As am I. 
and I cannot wait for things to return to normal just as soon as he stops declaring his undying love every time he's looked at an ale. Fritha No, Fritha cut in, still smiling but there was a firmness behind it now, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Now, are we all set for tonight? Airy sighed, but answered her. Yes. I've been looking at Lavik's diary and the translation you made, your notes were very interesting. Fascinating actually, the way he managed to incorporate the plane shift spell as part of the inner working of the sphere, though I can't imagine how he managed to get a sustainable power source, I am almost looking forward to finding out. Fritha smiled at her enthusiasm. Oh, someone's keen. Ari nodded taking a moment to consider it. Yes, it's funny really. It has taken Valigar to make me realize it, but I am really very proud to be a mage. Fritha laughed, Ari joining her, struck as well by the amusing irony of the thing. The elf shook her head still smiling as she confessed, I lost so much of who I was when I turned my back on my old life in Fainya Dale. I told myself that I was dead to that world, that I was that Avariel no longer. I only realized just recently that in trying to forget the part of my life when I still had my wings, I let a lot of other things go too. She frowned, waiting for that dark cloud to pass across her heart as she let her mind drift back there. It is painful to remember sometimes, but it was back then I first discovered the beauty of the weave learning different spells and techniques from my mother and by myself in her library after she had passed away. I learned a little at the circus, but I never studied it in the same way after I had been captured. And that is what I want to get back to. She finished decisively. Mother always said I had a lot of promise and I want to build on it. I will work hard and live my life and become the best person I can and perhaps when all this is over. She continued quietly, wary of voicing such fragile hopes, I will be able to return home, even if only for a little while, and see my sisters and father again. It won't be same as it was, but life moves forward and changes, and so must I. Fritha smiled kindly and nodded, and Ari felt an impish amusement stir within her as she added quickly, and just to let you know, I still think you should give a no-man a chance. Ari just ducked the pillow that was thrown at her head, Fritha laughing even as she roared, Oh, bugger off! Valigar was knelt and hunched by the tent flap, his broad back shielding the narrow triangle of the outside world from her view, Jahara raising herself slightly on her elbow where she was half reclined behind him. The rain is easing off, he offered. Jahara nodded. Good. And she meant it too. They had managed to pitch Valigar's well-used tent before the rains had become too heavy, but it was much smaller than the ones they had bought in Imnsvale with little room to sit and they had spent a cramped and awkward few hours laying next to each other in the gloom just listening to the rain beat against he canvas around them. For a time. The ranger's breathing had deepened as he had snatched a few hours sleep, but not so for her. It had not occurred to her before, even though she had spent every night since they had left Imns Vale sharing a tent with the snoring form of Minsk, but this was the first time she had slept next to a man since Khalid had passed. Jahara frowned, realizing that it was the sort of foolishness that would be found in the girls' romance novels and not liking the comparison. She was missing him at the moment, the longing within her almost as bad as when he had first been taken, her heart aching with the knowledge that everything would have been so much better had he been there with her, perhaps even instead of her. Everything was fading. She could still remember what he looked like, how his voice sounded, but that feeling of just having near was fading from her memories and Jahara knew it would only be a matter of time before everything went as well. As a druid, she should have accepted it the summer that faded to a winter, but she knew in this case there would be no spring, at least, not as it had been. A few more moments dragged by, 
the gentle patting of the rain the only thing to break the silence between them, before that too slowly faded and Valigar threw the tent flap wide and moved outside, Jahara taking a moment to pull on her boots and grab her pack before joining him. The air was cold and fresh after the humid warmth of the tent, the world about them vivid and sparking as a shaft of sunlight streamed through the clouds above to catch every droplet in that dripping forest. Jahara turned, glancing down at the tent she had just crawled from. Circumstances had forced them to conceal it as best they could, cutting some bracken from the undergrowth and hacking down a few branches that still had some leaves clinging to them, Jahara regretting such actions were necessary even as she had worked. It is a shame such is required, came Valigar, reading her thoughts, the man dropping his pack on the sodden ground to sit upon it. Will Fritha face the same within the city? Jahara shrugged, dropping her own bag opposite and sinking down as well. It is doubtful. Unlike the cowled wizards, the harpers will not bring trouble to Athcatlas streets. The bounty hunters they will have stirred up may not be of the same concern, of course, but I doubt Fritha will be allowed to make her way anywhere alone. You speak of the night. Valigar assumed, continuing with his disapproval, one who has chosen the life he has should know better than to try and form such attachments, it rarely leads to anything but disappointment. You speak from experience. Perhaps, he said evasively, admitting after a moment, her name was Suna. She died with the others in the caverns of the Troll Mountains. That is all that needs to be said. Jahara sighed, the sun disappearing behind another cloud and her mood was suddenly as melancholy as that damp decaying forest. It is hard to lose one's companions. The ranger nodded. Yes, though harder still to be forced to end their lives yourself, have you considered surrendering to the Harpers? Yes. She said after a moment admitting something to him that she would have flatly denied to anyone else, but without knowing how far this corruption has spread and with so many within their ranks out for revenge, I cannot be sure of a fair trial. What did you do that warranted such action? As I said, a small number of harpers under a man called Galvary tried to imprison Fritha, to contain the chaos she is propheses to sow despite having little evidence to support their claims. When I would not let them, a fight broke out, Galvary and the other harpers involved were killed and now we are pursued for their murders. Valigar sent her a measured look. And do you still believe you acted correctly? Yes, she answered very promptly, not wanting to even consider the alternative, Fritha's imprisonment was nothing more than a show to gain favor with our more senior members. You are so sure? The girl is worthy of your trust, considering what she gave up to help you, Jahara snapped, glad to feel the fire of her conviction and in that instant she felt closer to Khalid than she had in long while. But, she continued more calmly, making no apology for her sharpness, what are your plans once Lavak is defeated and your oath is fulfilled? The ranger shrugged turning to gaze blankly through the trees in the direction of the city. Cowled wizards will still be hunting me, even if only to kill me for thwarting them and ruining their chances of obtaining the sphere. I will have to return to hiding, though I will be free of my oath and that will be recompense enough. And what of you? He continued, raising himself slightly to unfasten his flask from the pack beneath him. Your own lives could be in danger once the wizards have learned of your betrayal. We have a knight of the order in our company and friends elsewhere, both in the city and without, who wish us to remain alive for one reason or another, the cowled wizards will not act openly against us. Valigar took a long draught of water, holding her gaze as he swallowed to ask pointedly, and what of the harpers? Jahara felt her lips curl slightly in a dry smile. Once back in the city I will work on getting word of our innocence to those I know will hear me. Any who knew me in the Harpers, truly knew me, will listen and believe. 
Valigar passed the flask to her, with a wry smile of his own. Then let us drink to our impending freedom. Valigar strode over the rain slick cobbles, Jahara at his side and keeping pace with him in a way that would have surprised him had he not previously known another who had managed just as well. It had been easy enough to enter the city. The gates were never closed except in times of unrest and slipping past two weather-worn guards at the end of their shift was hardly a task, he and Jahara hurrying through the open gateway to be swallowed by the twisting maze of run-down streets, making their way to the northwest of the slums. Valigar cast about him, eyes searching every shadow as they walked through the sprawling mess of dilapidated warehouses, the ranger tensed for trouble, either from his new companions or in spite of them. A few of the better warehouses they had passed looked to be occupied, bright with the fires of those who could not even find a home within the slums. But that had been a while ago now, the great ramshackle buildings dark and silent about them and finally they were upon it, the wide junction where he had first been dragged by those mages, though it looked much different now, Minsk and Cern stood keeping warm by a small iron brazier a gnomon next to them as he burned what was likely some mix of herbs from the pungent almost spicy scent of the smoke, Airy moving a large leather bag in complicated patterns and leaving a trail of fine white sand. As she marked out the summoning circle, Fritha stood on the sidelines with Lavik's diary reading out the instructions. And then we just need the symbol of Demikov in the center, Airy, oh, hello there. Fritha called out brightly as she noticed their approach as though they had just met in local tavern, not the back end of the slums. You made it all right then. Jahara nodded once. Yes, the guards did not even note our passing. Oh, watch the line, Fritha cut in, pointing to the narrow line of sand that made a thin white border all around the casting area, a complicated symbol at each corner. Good, isn't it? The girl enthused as they both stepped over it and continued their approach. It's a nifty little charm that Airy worked out. It should keep the cowled wizards from realizing we're casting anything, though when a hundred-foot tall planar sphere turns up it's probably going to be a bit redundant. She laughed, Jahara joining her in a smile. So, is everything ready? Fritha shrugged. Pretty much. Ari is just finishing off the circle with the ritual sand we bought in Imn's Veil, vale, and a good job we did as well, it's far too wet to use chalk. A gnomon is just burning the herbs that should cleanse the air of any negative charges left over from the last spell that was started here, just a precaution, but one best taken. And now you're here, Valigar, we've the most important ingredient of all. She added blithely. Jahara snorted shaking her head as she moved to join the others at the brazier. For one about to do battle with a 500-year-old necromancer you are in remarkably fine spirits, Valigar observed dryly. Fritha grinned. Still worried those mages are going to make an appearance. Valigar frowned and she laughed heartily, clapping his arm. Oh, why take life so seriously? Will none of us get out alive? Well, that is me finished, came Airy, delicately picking her way back out the circle, the light breeze that was blowing doing nothing to disturb the sand she had just traced out. Fritha smiled and nodded, Airy dusting off her hands as Fritha passed her the diary. Good, good. Now the passage for the summoning is just here. I've written it out phonetically beneath for you. Are you sure you don't want to try the ritual first, Fritha? Start your education, as it were. The elf teased. It all seems simple enough, I mean, it can only not work. Fritha held up her hands before herself. No, no, I think I had best let the experts handle it. Ari laughed, taking the book over to the light of the brazier where she could better read it and Fritha watched her a moment, her face given a golden hue as she stooped over the yellow flames. Ari had made her offer when they had spoken earlier, 
when Fritha had finally wrestled her off the subject of a gnomon, that was, the elf offering to help her draw out and better understand the latent magic within her, just as Dinah Hare once had, though the witch Lairon had never had the chance in the end. Fritha was not really sure where she was going to find the time with trying to find work for them and Higgold having a crisis over at the theatre every other day. But it had been kind of airy to offer and it would be useful to learn about her ever-growing power. More than that, Airy seemed to need the company at the moment, the girl trying so hard to face up to her past whilst walking towards her future. And, as Fritha considered how much she had been talking to herself recently, perhaps it would not hurt for her to have a little more company either. It seemed her lessons were not something that all of them considered a benefit though, Valigar turning that familiar frown upon her to ask, You are apprenticing to Eri? Oh, no, no, Fritha refuted genially, but there is a magic in me, probably something to do with the ball blood sloshing around my veins, and Eri has very kindly offered to help me learn more of it. Valigar looked astounded. There is a magic within you with likely roots to a divine evil, and you would encourage this power. Oh gods, look at his eyes. Only a century ago he would have been head of the bonfire building committee, suffer not the witch to live. Is something amusing? He asked sharply as she felt her face twist with a smirk, the girl quickly shaking her head. No, nothing. And I know it sounds bad, Valigar, but this power grows without any encouragement from me, so I thought it would be wise to find out at least make sure I have full control of it. Goodness, don't look so afraid. She laughed gently, trying to put him at ease. My latest discovery was hardly earth-shattering, see? She quickly sectioned out a long curl of hair to show him pressing a finger either side of the lock at the roots and pulling down the length, taking the curl from it as she went to leave it as straight and sleek as Nalia's had been. Fritha laughed, the trick still new enough to be delighted in. It doesn't even last very long, it clearly takes something stronger than the sorcery of mere mortals to take the curl from my hair. She flicked the end to send the curl ripping back up it though the expression on Valigar's face could not have looked more appalled if it had turned into a live snake and tried to bite him. Are we ready? called Eri and the pair turned back to find her stood at the far end of the circle, right, er, Valigar, I, well. You need some of my blood, the ranger supplied for her bluntly instantly drawing his knife to slice along the top of his palm with a detachment that made the elf wince. Oh, ah, right, just a splash in the center should do it, she instructed, Valigar leaning over the outer symbols, careful not to disturb the sand as he let a few bright scarlet drops fall on the overly complex sign of Demikov. Eri nodded once, drawing a deep breath, one hand aloft, the other holding the diary as she began to intone the spell. El party sempris en Athan, Lavak, Lavak Pertis Yentis Imara. Ares' chant went on long enough for the silence to seem strange once she had finished. There was a definite tingle to the air now, Fritha's hair protesting with bright spits of static as she moved to pin it back. Everyone was looking up, searching the cloudy skies for some sign that would signal their retreat to a safe distance, Fritha waiting for her eye to catch on something akin to a shooting star, but not even the moon had appeared to break that heavy field of grey. Across the circle, Ari was frowning, reading over the diary again checking for some error on her part and Fritha sighed, letting her attention drift, the light from the brazier throwing odd shadows against the warehouse walls, faint lines reflecting in the still flickering flames, crossing this way and that in rectangles of differing sizes, all connecting together. Fritha blinked, quickly turning to look about her, the faint outline of a cluster of pipes running along the air at their side room after room with walls of riveted panels stretching off in all directions, the ghosts of hatchways and ladders and machinery all hanging in the air, the dark backdrop of warehouses and sky still visible through them all as the vessel slowly materialized about them. Fritha glanced down, the specter of a girder passing neatly through her abdomen and she felt her panic swell as it dawned on her. 
Oh, gods! Run! Just an instant to check the others had heeded her and Fritha turned to tear back along the street, ears filled with the sudden roar of her blood, her pulse thundering with the heavy footfalls of those just behind her. She reached their line of safe distance first, the junction of the next set of warehouses, the girl whirling back and there it was, whole before them, a great smooth sphere of dull bronze plates. By helm! breathed a no-man behind her, his awe mirroring her own. It was huge, twice the height of any of the surrounding warehouses, the summoning circle now obscured beneath it and Fritha realized why the mages had originally placed the summoning point there. The sphere had cut clear away the warehouse they had just been next to, the walls where it had materialized just gone, vaporized, just leaving the rest of the dilapidated old storehouse as whole as it had ever been, as though the sphere had always been there and the warehouse had been constructed around it. And just above the roof, halfway up the smooth globe Fritha could see it, a pale yellow light streaming from an open hatchway. Did you know it would just appear like that? asked Cerned, a little breathless himself. Of course not, and at no point in that diary did it mention anything about it either, answered Fritha crossly, feeling as though the book had somehow betrayed her. Oh, no, no. No. Who says this is very bad? What is it Minsk? Came Jahara, turning a frown upon the ranger. But Fritha had suddenly noticed it too as she cast about them, Ari and Valigar were gone. End of chapter